What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Creator Support. Today, we're talking about our second biggest source of income. We're going to reveal how much money we've made on shorts. We're going to talk about how to say no. And we're going to start with how much YouTubers charge for collabs. All right. Our first question is from Bocano. It says, do YouTubers charge for collaboration videos? There's different rates for different creators. So Mr. Beast charges $250,000. <laughs> for a collab. For a collab. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Someone's going to clip that. Yeah, that was a joke. But you want to know who actually charges $250,000? Who? Snoop Dogg. For real? Yes. For what? A feature? Yeah, for a feature. Oh, interesting. And if you want him in a video, it's another $250,000. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, guess, this is common in music. So, yeah. Okay. Now, let just for real now, let's, let's talk about this question. This is a question that I feel like comes up a lot. People are like, how did you get that collab? Did you, did you pay money? Like, what's the exchange? And in hip hop, you're right. Like bring up Snoop Dogg in hip hop. This is common practice to pay for a feature. The baby, $300,000. The baby's 300,000. Yeah. It's, so he says. It's, it's rumored that Drake is a million. Wow. Which, which kind of makes sense because you think about the value exchange there of if I'm an up-and-coming hip-hop artist and I get Drake on my song. It's a stamp of approval, and it comes with a lot of distribution. Yeah, and it comes with distribution because people are also searching Drake. Mm -hmm. Collaborations are also the way that people grow on YouTube. Yeah. You look at how we grew. It was a series of collaborations through the years. Eric, a ton of really clever mm -hmm. collaborations. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think... Um, you know, just to zoom in on Eric, I think that's a really interesting example. I mean, he's pretty open and he talked to us about like how he got to those collabs. You know, it's very clever ways of providing value to creators. He talked about just the, the difference in leverage that each person has. When you're a startup creator and you approach a bigger creator, the reality is you need to come to them with some level of value. Because them showing up in your content is a lot of value. And if you don't have a pre-existing relationship, there's got to be some level of value exchange. And, you know, for Eric, when he was with Logan Paul, like Logan made this whole, you know, big statement about how he was trying to get rid of these Mercedes-Benz couches that he didn't want. And Logan was making content out of that. And so what Eric realized is like, he needs an end to that story. That's interesting. And so Eric was the buyer and went over and, you know, you can watch that whole series, the couch series. And then Logan got a vlog out of that, which was value. He not only got rid of the couches, he also got a vlog for his own channel. And then Eric took those couches and, you know, obviously kind of built his, his, his career basically off of, off of that. He did a series, series. of four yeah. or five episodes yeah. where he did really clever, interesting things with the yeah. couches, including skydiving mm -hmm, with the couches, mm -hmm. blowing them up. Yeah. But what's interesting is that's just, I think, you know, that's one version for us, when we started, you know, we had pre-existing relationships with creators, but, you know, one of our first co big collaborations was Mr. Beast on, on our YouTube channel. After he did Finger on the App, we had him on, on the channel. And, you know, there, that, that exchange was kind of like Jimmy on his channel is Mr. Beast, but we offered him a storytelling avenue where he could explore, like, what he was doing from a business perspective. And I just want to offer that as like value can come in so many different ways. Yeah. Or if you look at Yes Theory, yeah. we helped them make a, a movie, documentary. Yeah, that's true. And the exchange there was we get to cover it, mm -hmm. cover the behind the scenes and talk about it on our channel. Right. And that was something they too weren't going to share right. on their main channel. Yeah. So we, we approached collaboration and have always approached collaboration from a value exchange perspective of can we offer you a storytelling space? that tells a completely different style of story side of yourself that you're not going to tell, you know, or that you don't have the, the space to tell. Um, and I think that's why, you know, early on our show was able to, to bring on people like Marquez Brownlee, you know, like Andrew Schultz, Lily Singh, um, Hassan Minaj, like we were able to, to offer a, a platform and a space to tell a different type of story. But to answer that question, I would say, no, there is not a culture of paying to collaborate specifically with YouTube creators. I've never seen it with Instagram, with TikTok, anything like that. I have heard about it with podcasts. Really? Yeah. Like, like if you want me on your show, it costs X. We covered it in the press one time. Yeah. 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 It's, it's never happened with us. No one has ever asked. Like if we're like, Hey, we'd love to have you on the show. No one has ever been like, here's my rate. I would still say it's very rare. Yeah. But 
question for you, like, and for us, what does it take for, for, because a lot of people ask us to do stuff now to come on their channel or to collaborate with them. What do you feel like it takes for us to do that? Similarly to what it probably takes people to be on our show, there has to be a unique opportunity to tell a story that we're not going to tell here. Yeah. We recorded with the editing podcast. Mm -hmm. It's not out yet. Yeah. But that was an opportunity to talk about deep edit work. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that necessarily on either of our channels. Yeah, totally. You have to provide us a unique opportunity to share a side of ourselves. I'd say that's where we are. Yeah. Or you have to be our friend. That's another thing, right? Like relationships and trust, mm -hmm. like that builds towards wanting to collaborate because I enjoy creating with you. You know, that's another, like the Yes Theory guys ask me to do something. I'm like super open to it because they're our friends. I love collaborating with them. Pretty open. If they're like, hey, I'll blindfold you and drop you in a country. Sure, I'm in. I don't know, man. My, my rate for that is $250,000. <laughs> um, all right. Next question is a video question from Sam Dawson, all the way from the United Kingdom. Hey guys, I've got a question. So I feel like as two successful creators on the platform, you guys must have had things come up where other brands or other, com or other companies have wanted to like snipe you, take your talent and use it for their own benefit, right? Use you guys. Maybe, maybe this happens less now, but there must have maybe a point a few years ago where companies wanted to do that. Did you ever struggle with saying no to stuff because you wanted to put time into your own vision and build your own channel, which is what you've done now? Um, yeah, was that was that ever difficult, saying no to stuff? Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I just seem to say yes to everything. And I feel like it's something that, as a community, we don't talk about enough, is how important it is to sometimes say no to certain things. So, yeah, that's my question. Love the channel. Keep it up. Uh, yeah, cheers, guys. That's a great question from Sam. I, I do think it's something that um, is really important for creators at every point in their journey to understand when to say yes, when to say no. Um, it's exceptionally hard at the beginning of your journey because you almost look at this hierarchy of needs as a creative. And if you jump both feet in to being a creator full-time or a creative full-time, your number one need is money. And that creates a scenario that we were in. We jumped both feet in to mm -hmm. being creators full-time with zero subscribers on a channel. Yeah. So our immediate need was money. Um, so saying no felt ridiculous to any monetary opportunity because that was our number one priority. And I think as you start as a, as a creator or creative, you, you start in a scarcity mindset where you don't have views, you don't have subscribers, you don't have opportunity, you don't have financial stability. Like you don't have a lot. So you typically say yes to all types of things. In our early days, we made stickers for a company for a thousand dollars. We made a website for eight hundred dollars for someone. Yeah, like just, and, and for anyone interested, that's Colin and Samir Stickers.com. <laughs> Dude, don't rates, someone's gonna buy rates that. Rates have gone someone's up. Someone's gonna buy that and sell stickers. Rates now, have gone huh? up since then, but <laughs> they are premium quality stickers. But it wasn't even our own stickers. We made stickers yeah. for someone else's company. Yeah. Like we just designed stickers and found a sticker manufacturer. Yeah. Um, and none of that added to our overall, you know, how we were gonna grow our brand but it gave us the fuel to, to try. Um, I think what was challenging in the beginning of saying yes to all of this was a lot of it was video work, going to film you know, someone else's thing, going to um, help someone edit something. And by the time you're done with that work, you don't really wanna edit your own YouTube video. You're kind of exhausted. And that was something that was challenging for us in the, in the early days, for sure. I'll give a specific example of when we said no. One of the first times I truly remember it, it was 2021, the Colin and Samir show uh, was just starting to take off and a company reached out to us and asked if we would basically do something similar, create our education in video form on a shared new platform. And the rate that they gave us was one of the biggest rates we'd seen yeah. at that time. And we ended up saying no because we knew what our goals were that year. Our goal was not necessarily revenue-based for the first time. Our goal was much more about making the best show that we could every week. And yeah. sure, we were going to monetize some of those shows, but the number one goal was making the best show we could every single week. And that framework helped us say no. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how we came to that framework was actually 
Josh, who is our <laughs> partner in the published press, when we first brought him on, he spoke to you and I mm-hmm. and asked us a ton of questions and just listened. And then he would write up exactly what we said. Mm-hmm. Like he would ask us about our goals and then be like, well, this is what you said you wanted to do. Yeah. So this opportunity that may be the most amount of money you've seen to date is actually not in line with what you want to do yep. and where you think you're heading. And I think for someone like Sam uh, or another creator who's trying to figure out, should I say no to this? It comes down to goals and frameworks. I would honestly mm-hmm. recommend getting a friend, getting on a recorded Zoom or Hangout and then putting it into Descript <laughs> and being like, what did I, what just, did say? I just say? Yeah, and yeah, let yeah. it be a stream of consciousness, totally. not like a premeditated answer. Because when you just flow, yeah. you'll figure out what you actually want. I think important context there is that, um, you know, what happened in 2020 and into 2021 was w- we got an annual deal with Samsung and that annual deal paid our bills. And we're still with Samsung. Like this is still, you know, a, a, a great long-term partnership that we've been in, but it, it, an annual partnership gives you a guaranteed amount of money for a year, which is why we were in a position that revenue was going to become a problem later in 2021, but it wasn't at that moment. At that exact moment. At that moment, it wasn't a problem. And our number one goal that we wrote down was make a best in class show every Monday. That was our number one goal. And so when Josh listened to us and listened to this new opportunity, he was like, that's a great opportunity, but your goal is to make the best in class show every Monday. And again, I think it's important context that we had the privilege at this moment to have a deal that was bringing in enough money to pay for us, to pay for a team member, to pay for Josh to you know work with us. Like there was a lot of um, stuff that, that we were able to pay for because of that. And again, it's about that hierarchy of needs, you know? And at that moment, our need was, you know, we got to focus now on building the brand. And I think that like focus and prioritization, unbelievably hard for creators and creatives. For me, I need people around me to, like you said, like reflect back and remind me what my goals are. You can't make these decisions in a vacuum all the time. Something that we've done in the past is ask some creators to about specific deals. So Sam, I would find a specific friend and be like, here's the terms of this deal. Do you think I should take this? You did that with Ryan Trahan one time yep, yep. about one of our deals. Yep. And that was that was really helpful. It was really helpful yeah, advice. Really helpful. So I think like, just don't go at these decisions alone. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to offer though, is again, on that hierarchy of needs, like if if money is a need right now and experience and and stability could support it, I don't want to suggest that being an independent creator is like, the only path. I think people who go and work for other creators or in the business that they want to be in, like you and I, when we worked, you know, with, with creators like Dude Perfect at, at, you know, like that for us taught us about YouTube. It taught us about the business and what we wanted to go do. Today, what we do is largely because of being employed, you know, like yeah. in, in a YouTube company. And that for me, like I still use things I learned from there. So if you want to go take a full-time job for a year or two and work with a creator or work at a creative production company, it's going to teach you a lot. 100%. I don't, gonna, think, I don't think we say that enough. I don't that think we say that enough. Had yeah. we not been employees of another company from 2014 to 2016, yeah, we would not be even remotely close to where we no, are now. We learned everything there. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you're seeing it right now, like Dan Mace is now working at Mr. Beast, right? how much is Dan about to learn in the next year or two that he's going to, I mean, you're already seeing him apply it to his own channel. Obviously Jimmy's in a lot of the content, but like he's applying stuff to his own channel and that's growing. I just want to offer it to all creators, like getting a job is a great opportunity. Which is a good segue because we are hiring right now. We are. Actually. I mean, that's something that we need support on. We are uh, looking to hire an editor. If you've noticed on our main channel, we haven't uploaded since... December, December 16th, call. December, December 16th. 16th, almost two months. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure. We've never done like an open call out yeah. for an editor. I'm not exactly sure how to put that call out. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the process should be for an edit test. How mm-hmm. do you evaluate someone? I've heard of some creators putting files together and having a bunch of people edit something, but I don't know how that actually works or how you would do that. Yeah, it's a Especially good- for our channel where the episodes are long. Some of them are complex. Yeah, it's a good question because- at any other point when we've hired, we haven't had like a established kind of brand or style. And now we, we have that and it's, it's interesting. So this is the part of the show where we're actually asking for your support. 
Who are you looking at? I'm, I'm looking there. <laughs> uh, we're asking for your support. So curious if you guys could, um, you know, put some thoughts in the YouTube comments of what's the best way to to hire an editor? Like if we do an open call out on Twitter, we're going to get a ton of DMs. Um, but if we put an application together, like a Google form, what type of creative work should you submit? If you're an editor who's applied or if you've hired other editors, let us know. Yeah, and if Curious. you're listening, you can also take that conversation to Twitter or in our subreddit, r yeah. slash Colin and Samir. Yeah. All right, this comes from our last episode, which was about YouTube shorts. This is from Jake and Joel are magic. Joel, that definitely says yeah, Joel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I said Joel. You took some liberties I there. I took liberties, but I'm not, I'm not great at reading aloud. Must have um, been thinking about Noel Miller. Mm -hmm. From TMG. It was. Also, congratulations to Cody Co. who got married this weekend. Great suit on Cody. Great suit. Honestly, Wait. great suit. Yeah. It is a black suit. It's a traditional suit. It's not traditional. That was a totally different cut. Two days ago, you told me I shouldn't go with a traditional black and white suit. Yeah. I Cody don't... went with a pretty traditional suit. Yeah. Why can't I? But it was, it was pretty traditional. Not exact. Come on, man. It was a different cut. No, I think you should express yourself a little no, bit. No, I got to gripe you're, with you. You're an artiste. You're, you're giving... Mixed feedback. No, I'm not. I said for you. How come he can wear a black and white traditional suit and I can't? I think you should express yourself a little bit. Like you're wearing a, a full jumpsuit right now, That's because this is creator support and, yeah. and this is my uniform. <laughs> All right, carry on. All right, Jake and Joel are magic. Just want to drop this here because I hope YouTube sees it. I'm currently tracking what we make. We've been posting a short a day for a year as a 50,000 sub channel, most of our shorts hit 100,000 views or more. With this new change, we've made a whopping $5 since this went into effect. We're making two cents for every thousand views. That means if we have a short that hits a million views, we make $20 on it. Not exactly rivaling TikTok with that payout. I get that Mr. Beast and Logan Paul are where the bulk of the money will go, but is it a slap in the face that if you were to take our channel's entire lifetime views, not just shorts of 30 million views and divide that by a thousand, and then again by two cents, our RPM, we would make $600. $600 for 30 million shorts views. Sorry to say, but this is te a terrible model and will not bring anyone to the platform. Just saying, just awful that channels under 100,000 subs are absolutely shafted. And this is speaking for our channel, which averages 200,000 views every 48 hours. Um, there's some commentary here on, on the channel as well. It said, I agree. It's a joke. Compare shorts channels, uh, production value. It's terrible. Okay. So basically there's people upset here. Now this was posted, um, two days ago, which is only like three days into February. Um, and you know, data also tracks a little bit slower, but it, I've seen this quite a bit right now on Twitter or like, this is something we talked to Todd and Renee about. If you haven't listened to our last episode about YouTube shorts, you know, we talked about that. We talked about the moment where creators are going to share their revenue, you know, and it's a really interesting position for YouTube because most of the, most of the RPMs are in the like two to four cent range. We've never seen that on YouTube. We haven't seen that since the beginning of YouTube, you know? And I, I think, um, what's important for creators to recognize right now is like, this is brand new. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that I know that it'll get better. I don't know that it will you know, explode or, or get a lot better. Um, but it's early, early days. Like for us on our channel, our RPM is, is four cents. Uh, and we've done 411,000 views in the first, I think three days of, of February. Um, so we made $18. Now, you know, that's not life changing. Again, as we mentioned in the last two episodes, when we talked about revenue from YouTube, you know, don't base your business off of YouTube payments. Don't do it. You know, if you're getting a hundred thousand views on shorts, you know, your, your goal here is to like build a brand with that audience and then find ways to monetize it. When it comes to revenue sharing, my assumption is that this is a brand new product, the same way that YouTube long form was a brand new product when we first started and you could barely make money on YouTube long form content. Now, 10 years later, it's a sophisticated ecosystem. Advertisers pay good rates for it. And it's a fully blown place where people make a lot of money. So I would just say like, you're three days in. I don't know why as creators, we're, we're feeling like we need this like instant gratification of like revenue sharing's on, all the advertisers believe in it and we're making thousands of dollars. Like that's gonna take time. Also just, I'm not sure it should be an expectation that you can 
make a living solely off of short form content. Yeah, I agree. Platform payouts. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like there should be no, like that is not, that should not come with the territory. Yeah. You know, like there are, if you need to make money, there are other ways to do it mm-hmm. rather than trying to be a creator. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I want to bring up Cassie Ho, who is a creator who's shifted to all short form vertical content. She does all shorts. She posts those across platforms. She sells a product and that exposure has turned her brands into, you know, both are eight figure brands, PopFlex and Blogilates. She has a fitness brand and, and an athletic wear brand. So I would utilize, like, think again about, okay, we're getting 100,000 views a day. That's a lot of people. How can you build a business with 100,000 dedicated people? You can do that, you know? Like, I bet you people are starting to explore. We've had conversations about sponsored shorts. We've had conversations about, you know, how can we drive traffic from a short to somewhere else? Like, if you're good at making short-form vertical content, just hold off on, on you know, the shorts payouts or just, again, use it, as we talked about before, found money. Now, I would also urge every creator on YouTube to like think about long form content because in the in the same amount of time, the first few days of February, we've done less views, 383,000 views. We haven't uploaded a video since December, long form video, but we've made $2,242. So as a platform, I think like YouTube does offer you significant, you know, opportunities to monetize but it's going to be in long form video because that's the established place. Yeah. And as a frame of reference, when it comes to shorts, for us specifically, it has been an improvement. We got some data that showed that in January of this year, we were making about a dollar for every 75,000 views on shorts. And off of the short that we posted in February, which literally was just posted, we've made $6. Mm -hmm. But the ratio there is about a dollar for every 20,000 views. So that's almost 3x post monetization. Yeah. Again, all of this may fluctuate. Yeah. But for us, it has shown that since shorts monetization has been turned on, we are making more money than before. I would just urge all creators to like deeply think about the fact that this is brand new. It's brand new. It's all brand new. Like it's all really exciting but it's brand new. I, I don't disagree with what um, Joe and Joel, Joe and Joel uh, said about like how most likely a lot of the revenue is going to float to the top. And the one thing that I think is interesting about, you know, the increase of revenue sharing across creators is the, the kind of middle class of creators has just added on a whole new category of casual creators. Like someone who doesn't create as a business, but is like, uh, upload a viral short every once in a while. I'll take part in trends. Yeah, sure. I'll take part in trends. And I think that's really interesting. It's a new class. Even when you look at what Elon Musk said about, uh, Twitter, he wants to start sharing revenue with people, um, you know, with, with, uh, ads that are in the replies of tweets. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to, to our show where we talked about our conversation with Elon, that's something he brought up on, on that. Um, and something that, that we workshopped, on that call, but I think it's a good idea to do that. So like, I've already seen ads and replies yeah. of tweets. It's really smart. So that's where the engaged conversation is, put an ad in there and he's going to share revenue with the creator of that tweet. But that also might not be that significant. No, but I think it's the step in the right direction that yeah. a casual creator, someone who just takes part in these platforms can be generating revenue from yeah. just participating. Yeah. You know, it can be someone who's not necessarily looking at it and playing the game of how viral can I go? How many views can I get? How much money can I get? But there may be an expectation uh, five, 10 years down the line that if you are just a casual participant in yeah. Instagram, in Be Real, any of these types of things, the expectation is you will yeah. share revenue. Now, the, the thing I'll say that like for all creators, it is very important because now what we're looking at is like views are somewhat created equal on these in these channels, right? Short form vertical, right now, views are somewhat created equal. And that means that you have to be very intent about building a brand because you'll be able to monetize your brand if you become singular. Like if you are the best in your niche, you'll get brand sponsors, you'll have opportunities to sell merchandise, like you'll have an actual deep connection with an audience. If you're just going for, let me get the most amount of views and it's kind of like idea-based content that any creator could do, your opportunity for monetization is going to be limited now. So that's what I would suggest. Like, you know, there's still going to be creators who can 
get millions and millions of views on long form content and generate large YouTube payments. But my suggestion to all creators is like deeply think about what makes you, you know, build depth with your audience and build a brand in the space because that's what's going to be monetizable. A jumpsuit. Yeah. Right? A jumpsuit. That's where you were going. That's where I was going. There was someone on Twitter who suggested that you put patches on this jumpsuit, like a published press patch. So people go subscribe to our newsletter, which the link is in the description, but you could even put all of that on the jumpsuit. You just write all of that on the front. You're just trying to turn me into an ad? Yeah, you could be a big ad. What? Yeah, just like a billboard. This jumpsuit's like a billboard This is about being real. This is about being authentic. Oh, please. My true self. By the way. How dare you monetize my jumpsuit? By the way, let's talk about being your true self. Because out of nowhere. All right. Out of nowhere. Why do I feel like you're about to attack me? You've become an Eagles fan. Like a Philadelphia Eagles fan. It's not out of nowhere. Oh, please. You've been an Eagles fan. I've known you for 11 years. You've been an Eagles fan before? Okay, but my fiance is a huge Eagles fan. Okay. From the moment we started dating, I took her to an Eagles bar. It was one of our early dates. So I've been over the years becoming an Eagles fan. My brother lives in Philadelphia. My brother lives in Philadelphia. You're the captain of the bandwagon. Like you're literally have a hat on. You're a conductor hat and you're driving the bandwagon around. What? (laughs) How, How dare you? Come on. How dare you? Yeah, I saw. I'm in, just getting saw, into sports, man. I know, but I saw. I'm an, just getting into sports. I, I saw an Instagram story, and you're wearing like. What's a, so wrong about that? Like an Eagles shirt or something? Because we were going to the playoffs an, at an the Eagles game. bar. Yeah, at the playoffs sports, man. And I was like, Is it who so is, wrong for me to get into guy? sports? Who is this guy? I don't even know you. What? Like Eagles, Colin? You know, Jalen Hurts, man. It's a big year. That's the only player you know. Who else do you know? There we go. <laughs> Jalen Hurts, man. <laughs> Was that entrapment? No, I just trapped you. <laughs> I swear I know more, man. I just, I'm, I'm blushing. I'm on the spot. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Well, whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I was, I, I, that was my segue to just quickly mentioning that Prime is running a Super Bowl commercial, which the average- That was your segue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a quick attack on the way. <laughs> quick personal attack. Wow. Okay, yeah. Carry on. <laughs> But Logan Paul and KSI, they're spending, I think, around $7 million on a Super Bowl ad for Prime. Isn't that incredible? I'm not impressed. I'm still still angry about your your personal attack. That's incredible. That is incredible. Um, I wonder if creator brands are going to start, you know, sponsoring the shorts feed. I think it'll be really interesting to start saying Feastables and Prime. We need to start running ads ads on YouTube. Yes. For For what? Publish Press? Publish Press. Yeah. Yeah. We need to get more. I think it'd be an interesting case study. Yeah, just to talk about on creator support. How do you even do it? I think it'd what's be, important yeah. and does it work? I like think if pu- we were to run ads with us in them, yeah. on YouTube mm-hmm. for the published press, could yep. we actually drive subscribers to the newsletter? Yeah, I think that's super interesting. I think as we roll out our next course, that'll be yeah. really interesting to run ads on YouTube for that. Um, it's just so yeah. underutilized by creators. I agree because if you're on YouTube and you see a YouTube creator, it's interesting. All right, let's get to the next question. Maybe we'll keep this one anonymous. I run a creator company and our main product is a YouTube channel created in 2015. We recently hired an intern with a former YouTube channel that is now active and covers topics somewhat related to what we cover, health. And we are now unsure how to handle her recent uploads that showcase her skills she learned from the internship with us. Should we ask her to sign an NDA, use her channel as a test ground, or consider her skills as an asset ignoring her YouTube channel? I'd appreciate any thoughts on this matter as creators may have similar problems. The intern is great at her job and this is not about firing her, but I'm curious how to handle an actual creator on our team, mitigating risks and finding the best solution for our company. This is a really interesting modern day employment, you know, scenario that we're going to continue to face. Because a lot of creators hire from within their community. For sure. And a lot of people so, within the community are creators themselves yeah. who make similar types of content, who are passionate about what you do. So this is something you're going to come across where you hire someone who is there to learn and then all of a sudden starts using those skills on their own platforms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, let's just give an example. Like we were saying, we, we're, we're hiring an editor right now. So let's say we hire an editor who comes in, who has a YouTube channel, which is actually probably preferable because they have experience creating content for YouTube. And let's say that editor starts working with us. And after two months, after kind of learning our style of storytelling, everything we've learned about YouTube, how we operate here, starts making content that follows the same value prop. It educates creators. Maybe it's about other creators on their own channel that feels similar in subject matter to what we're making and applies 
the skills that we've taught that editor and they start, you know, having success on their channel. What's our position there? Well, I would hope that that's something we talk about before the person right. even gets hired. I yeah. think it's difficult to make that change once the employee is already there, but you have to do it, I think. I don't, Yeah, I would feel pretty uncomfortable. I would say if it's different subject matter, I don't have a problem. Yeah, but if it's the same subject matter, which is the question. Which is the question. Then I think yeah. you would have to talk to the employee and be like, look, like while you're here, we need your energy yeah. focused on our channel because we're, we're taking the risk. We're paying you right. to contribute to what we're doing. Yeah. And we can't have like a competitive product that you're competing with ours. Like yeah. that, that's where it would be really challenging. Now, I, I mean, I think creators are just going to face this a lot as they're hiring because the best people to hire are going to be the ones who probably are really familiar with YouTube. And every young creative right now who's like an editor or someone who's, who's good at strategy probably has their own channel or wants their own channel. That's a, it's a, it's a hard situation. Um, I just think, but like, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't want you, if you're working for us, I don't want you competing with us. Totally. Like at all. I don't, I, and even I think your that's fair. Even your yeah. mental space. Yeah. To think like you are sharing mental space between your product mm -hmm. and our product, which we're paying you to work on. Yeah. Again, I think if it's a different subject matter, I don't, I think the culture that we are moving into is not such that like, hey, you have your own TikTok account that's about tasting pizza, like great. And Use if, the tactics we've taught you yeah, here. Yeah, if you've learned stuff from us, like go do that. But if it's exactly what we do as a product, that's extremely challenging. I mean, just think about it if like you went to work at a company that, uh, you know, made- Jumpsuits? Jumpsuits. <laughs> and uh -huh. then you were like, oh, I met the manufacturer. I know how to make excellent jumpsuits. I'm going to start a jumpsuit brand. Mm. It'd be like, well- you can't do that, right? Like you're competing with us now using our resources. Really good example of, of a situation that seems to be working well is Dan Mace, who's now working mm -hmm. with Beast Philanthropy. Yeah. And he's telling stories on Beast Philanthropy, but he's also telling some behind the scenes stories that have to do more about storytelling yeah. on his own channel. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, right? It's not like Dan Mace's channel just turned into a philanthropy channel with its own organization. Totally. You know, there's a distinction there between what he's doing on his personal channel and what's happening on, on the work channel. I'm fascinated by Dan's journey. I would, I've been, I mean, I've been watching Dan's stuff for six years or something. Like yeah. when, when he was Dan, the director, remember that? That yeah. was his username. Like I, I'm fascinated by Dan's journey. I'd love to interview him. If you don't know Dan Mays, he worked uh, with Casey Neistat while Casey was vlogging, doing and, edits and before for that. It. He was just, he was like a traditional film director. Like an, he directed advertisements mm -hmm. and films and like, after Casey, yeah. he went independent again on his own YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, as well as working on a show on Discovery. Yeah. And then now is back working with a creator, working with Mr. Beast. Um, it's just interesting that he's had a career on YouTube in creativity, but sometimes it's within the organizations yeah. of other creators. Um, I think we're in the deep end. Yeah. We are deep. We're deep, right? In the end. Snorkels on. Snorkels are on. Comment a snorkel emoji if you're here with us on YouTube. All right. Kaizen. On YouTube, what are other sources of income that you run your business with apart from merch, AdSense, and brand deals? Are public speaking events lucrative? Okay, so apart from merch, which we do have, apart from AdSense, which we do have, apart from brand deals, which we do have. Yeah, and, and the newsletter falls into, it's, it runs the same you know style of business, which is advertising and partnerships. Yep. Um, so if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll see there's sponsors on it. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times different types of sponsors that are on the channel. Um, so like that's also sponsorship based. So the company is largely sponsorship and partnership based. Yep. So, n you know, number one at the top, brand deals, sponsorships. And the reason I say that as brand deals and sponsorships, sometimes our partnerships include like other things, consulting, you know, other, other elements. So, um, that's, that's at the top. I would say right under that is public speaking which is so interesting. Yeah, last year we had a, a big rise in public speaking opportunities. Yeah, and I think that's because, you know, back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, it's not just viewership, you're building a brand. I think, our, you know, our brand started to building the space as, as thought leaders on the creator economy, um, just because our content was sharing our thoughts and speaking about the space. So that naturally we got 
you know, offered opportunities to come speak. And yes, the answer to that question is public speaking is lucrative. Um, you do have to travel and you do have to be an expert on a subject matter, which takes time to develop. So it's not like it's, it's something that you can just be like, I'd like to be a public speaker. There has to be a level of demand from the market to say like, I'd like Colin and Samir to come speak here because of their 11 years of experience <laughs> and the amount of creators they've interviewed and their expertise on the subject. So that takes years to develop. Yeah. But once you have it, it, it does become very lucrative. I would also add that it's lucrative, but it's not like you just show up for no. the hour and talk. From our experience, there's a lot of pre-production, prep, yeah. prep uh, meetings, rehearsing, uh, sometimes certain things to talk about. Like, it's not like you always just show up. There are some people who have like a tight 45 minute presentation and they travel around and give the same presentation. Well, there's, yeah, I was going to say there's different types, right? So there's, there's a keynote, which is when you see someone come and do like 45 minutes. We had someone on the show um, named Ben Nempton. He's one of the best speakers in the world. He goes two or three times a week around the country uh, to, to speak. And, and also markets his book. Yeah, he markets his book. So it's like, so he's a, a traditional speaker. Then there's like panels where people will actually pay to have you featured on a panel at an event because it helps them sell tickets for people to come to that event. That's unprepped. That's you show up, you re, you react to the questions, you you answer. And then there's, you know, um, another line, which we've now gotten into, which is hosting, where we'll actually host events. So we'll be the ones on stage, you know, providing context. We do this, you know, for YouTube quite a bit. We do it, uh, we've done it for, for Samsung. We've done it for other brands where we'll actually go and host um, that requires a lot of work. Hosting requires a lot of work. That's like script writing. That's the flow of the show. That's mm -hmm. like producing a video, but live on stage. And sometimes those can be three, four day events where yeah. there's all types of programming yeah, yeah, yeah. and every night you're rehearsing, mm -hmm. going over the different topics, making sure you understand what yeah. you're going to be talking about. So I would say like, yes, lucrative, but oftentimes you see authors do this because authors, you know, again, they have demand. They they wrote something, they became an expert on a subject and then they can speak about it. Okay, last Question here from YouTube, Tyler Lance, will you have a full new studio tour? Answer, yes. Yes. We will be making a studio tour. It's going to go up on the main channel. That's going to be our first video on the main channel this year, which we're really excited about. We've already started planning it. If you're watching here on YouTube, then you can kind of see like everything looks different. It's, it's coming together. It's finally like the set is done. Most of the studio's done. Our cold brew keg keeps breaking. Yeah. So, God, and we've been told there's probably mold. In the tank? Well, by your fiance. Yeah, but she works at a coffee shop. Well, she should come look at it. Okay. I, I think we As an Eagles it. fan, she should come look okay. at it. Okay. <laughs> easy, easy with the Eagles stuff, you know? Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts, man. man. Jalen Hurts so good. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's th that's definitely coming. That's coming. We're going to have videos on the main channel coming soon. Um, if you have advice for us about hiring an editor, put that in the comments. And now, can I end with a gripe? Please. May I end with a gripe? Please. Okay. I'm really happy right now with the pants I have. I have like a good lineup of pants. A you plethora know what? of pants. It's not a plethora. It's just the exact right amount of pants. Okay. And they're all, I'm excited about all of them. You know, there's sometimes in your wardrobe where you wake up and you're like, oh, these pants, I don't want to put these on. Yeah, yeah. But my issue right now is all of these cool pants that I have, every single one, buttons instead of zipper. And buttons instead of zipper, I'm not into. I, mean, I hate to tell Sucks. you, but I think this is a repeat gripe. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I've said this before. You've said this gripe before. Well, that's how much I dislike it. This is, yeah. Okay. That's how much I dislike it. Right, I'll, 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 I'll say it. I'll say it for a third time. What's up with buttons instead okay, of sure. zippers? Yeah, yeah. I'll <laughs> layer on top another gripe here. When you have great pants, as I do too, mm -hmm. you are bottom heavy and I don't have enough tops. I don't have enough good tops to rival my pants. It's an issue because every morning I get up and I can choose my pants. Yeah. I feel great about pants. Mm. I look at my tops and I'm like, mm. my top game isn't as good as my What was that sound you game. just made? <laughs> you, you roar in the morning? Yeah, that's how mm. I feel every morning when I look at my plethora of pants and feel that I don't have the tops necessary mm. to complement the pants. We are, I am, was so, that a fish over yeah, here? Yeah, we we're, are. We're, there's we're, algae we're growing We're swimming in the deep end right now. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge that the, how we were just speaking reminded me of the a AI Seinfeld 
on Twitch that I was playing. Yeah. That was crazy. We got to do a full episode. We got to do AI. a full AI episode. If you haven't seen that, just watch Ludwig's video about it. And if you know of any good places with pants with zippers, let us know. We'll see you next week. <laughs>